but it has so been the stop the watching Fox or CNN or whatever you watch with Fox News. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to another edition of TRD Talks Live, where we go and talk with some of the, you know, the leaders in the real estate industry about the issues that are facing us at this unprecedented time. I'm Hitan Santani, the associate publisher at The Real Deal. And today we're going to be talking about the retail landscape in New York City and, and in the larger sort of real estate market in the country. Uh, retail has probably been hit the hardest of, of all the sectors so far. There's been talk of up to half, ten half the tenants not paying rent. There are some existential questions about where we go from here in terms of landlord tenant dynamics, in terms of the makeup of retail in our core cities. And uh, there's a lot of anxiety. And luckily, we have with us today three of the leading deal makers in the real estate space. And they're going to sort of walk us through some of these issues and what they think is going on. Uh, but before that, I, I did want to give a shout out to our sponsor. RxR Realty. RxR has uh, generously agreed to support this event, so we thank them. And uh, Hannah is going to play a video from RxR for their new nonprofit initiative. The COVID-19 pandemic has devastated small businesses and nonprofits across the New York region. So, how can you help? Introducing RxR Volunteer, an online platform that connects skilled professionals with local small businesses and nonprofits in need. Whether it's guidance on loan applications, legal advice, marketing tips, insurance questions, or other critical business needs, volunteers can use their skills to help the local economy recover. Getting started is easy. Visit rxrvolunteer.com and create a profile. Get matched with small businesses and nonprofits that need your help. Support your community when they need it most. Start helping today. Register at rxrvolunteer.com. So that's rxrvolunteer.com. If you want to be involved in that initiative, please check out that website. When we recap this panel, we'll also have links to, to that. So I wanted to start uh, also by thanking our subscribers so far. It's been great to have your support as we try to uncover these issues. Our reporters and editors are working around the clock to try to make sense of this. Uh, for many of us, for all of us, this is the first time in our careers that we've seen something this all-encompassing and this existential. So. We really appreciate your support. And for those who haven't subscribed, really, really appreciate if you could take a minute, go to therealdeal.com and subscribe. And since I'm an egomaniac, I had the team create a special discount for this week. If you use the code HIT10, you get a 10% discount for a digital annual subscription, and it's only valid for this week. So if you want to take advantage of it, please do. And uh, so we'll get started with our panel. I want to introduce our, our panels. As I said, three of the leading deal makers in New York City retail real estate. We have David Feierstein with the Shopping Center Group. We have Jeffrey Roseman with Newmark Knight Frank. And we have James Famularo with Meridian, Meridian Retail Leasing. These gentlemen have put together the most creative and interesting deals, brought some of the biggest tenants into New York City, as well as some of the most exciting restaurants and retail concepts. However, we're in a situation now where, you know, deal making as we know it has, has essentially been suspended. So I think I wanted to start just by, just by understanding uh, in terms of activity, in terms of activity where we are. If you could just, one of you could give me a frank assessment of retail activity at the moment. David, maybe we could start with you. Sure. So I think, um, you know, for, for all retailers, it, it's, it's a moment of pause. We, you know, we have to remember... That, that the typical retailer is open 360 plus days a year. I mean, some of them, um, I, I do work for Starbucks. Starbucks is basically open every day of the year, but even whether it's apparel, movie theaters, you know, nobody's built to be closed and they've been closed for um, now six, six weeks, most of them or so, or at least partially closed. So. Um, I think retailers have, have used it as, as, as a moment, not only they are on, are on pause, but, but really to stop and think about their entire portfolios. But new deals um, so far aren't, aren't happening. I think the market, you know, one of the things we'll talk about for sure is going to reset. We may all have different opinions as to where it's going to reset, but it will reset. James, uh, your take on that, you know, you're a pretty optimistic guy in general, big, big uh, believer in the New York market. 
Is there anything right now that you're seeing that is giving you some sign of optimism in terms of activity? Um, I think, well, well, one thing is I think people are, um, I think you've seen it, especially the last week or two, um, people are talking about reopening or what that's going to look like. So that the conversation um, has, has shifted. I, again, going to Starbucks um, in the New York region, they opened, um, they had a number of stores open. They opened 125 more stores this week getting back in the game those are all just you know pick up um for now but they have um over 60 percent of the portfolio open in new york and you know over the next month or so that'll that'll get up to probably something like 90 percent and i think i think you'll see other retailers following suit anything from uh, james jeffrey any any signs of optimism any signs of life well, so I, I, I think in the first few weeks, I think you, you saw uh, most people were shocked. And I saw all deals paused. Um, I think after the first few weeks, people were starting to come back. We closed a handful of deals. So I'm seeing more and more optimi uh, optimism each day that goes by. So uh, people are, are, are surprised when, when things like this happen. You know, mm -hmm. of course, there's going to be shock. Of course, there's going to be people that, that don't want to transact. But I, I think I see a V-shaped recovery. I see the majority of people come back. I want to, since you bring up the words V-shaped recovery, we're just listening to an interview with Sam Zell a couple of days ago. Sam, who's generally someone who pounces on a crisis like this, said, you know, one of the things that I don't think we can assume here is a V-shaped recovery, because he's like, I haven't shaken hands with anyone in eight weeks, okay? I had to order, yesterday I ordered takeout from a Michelin-starred restaurant, this is what he said. He's like, it's, it's, not, it's not prudent to assume a V-shaped recovery at this point, because there's no signs that that is happening. So I guess, where do you get, where do you get that from? I mean, I, I remember 9-11 uh, mm. when it first happened, everybody, including myself, thought that business is over in Manhattan. Um, I was talking to some investors that wanted to steal properties around the downtown area. And I remember it, it, it felt like immediately, uh, a few months after, things were leasing for market. Some were above market. Um, and the same thing after the mortgage crisis, um, you know, this is a market like any other market. We have our ups and have our downs. This is very unique in that we haven't had a pandemic on this scale in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. so, so we're in uncharted territories, but this is New York. We are re really resilient here. We'll bounce back, I'm sure, stronger than ever. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, if I can add, and, and I think the, the right word that both the guys used is pause. You know, what, what I was, what I was uh, optimistic about was most of the deals that I had in my pipeline and, and my associates at the office, the same thing. Those deals did not get, uh, um, you know, people didn't walk from those deals. And, and to, I think James made the point. I think everybody was in shock in the beginning, but nobody threw the towel in. So mm -hmm. those deals have been progressing. Um, I think as of pretty recently, we're starting to hear some more velocity in the marketplace. Uh, mm -hmm. We've had a bunch of space showings in the past week that was – you know, I was very pleased about that. And, and so, um, you know, look, it's, there, there's, there's a long term and a short term to this, right? As there is to, you know, as there was to 9-11, although I think people were a little bit, you know, people who have lived through 9-11, I think have a bit of a different view uh, on these uh, crises that we go through. Um, because, you know, when you're, when you're going through it, it's, it's the worst thing that can possibly happen. Uh, and 9-11 was, and now this is, and, and you can't think of anything that could be worse. But as, as James just pointed out, there's resiliency in this city.
When, when you talked about, when you're talking about some of these deals that did close, I'm curious, uh, in residential real estate, we're seeing something as a quote unquote coronavirus clause. Uh, are you seeing anything in the, because uh, we have a lot of brokers on this call and, and landlords as well. Are you seeing the language in these leases change? Are you seeing, uh, you know, act of beyond, this is beyond an act of God clause, right? This would be something more. So David, yeah. Jeff, any, anything on yeah. that? Cer certainly um, moving forward, you know, certainly in the immediate future, if, if somebody is signing a lease today and they're going to start building in the next few months, um, they, they want to be sure that they're going to not get shut down again if there is a second wave and what can happen. So, so you know, everyone is going to want to be protected from that. Um, and then moving forward, you know, I used, leases were complicated enough uh, as 100 pages, and now there's going to be a lot more pages added covering pandemics. I, I'm not sure we ever sort of dealt with that before in, in a lease, but who thought of it? And, and here we are. Is there any retroactive? Uh, just, is there anyone coming in who might have signed a deal 30 days ago, 45 days ago, and saying, hey, by the way, could we inject certain language in this because I'm not feeling as comfortable? Is that happening at all? Um, I, I am see, um, David, I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, I, I mean, I think, I think there's um, retrading on, on that. I think, I think in most cases, landlords are being cooperative on that. That's different than, than what you're talking about, about putting the language in. That's really a going forward mm -hmm. thing. And, um, you know, I think there'll be a process to that. They'll, they'll, you know, each, each tenant's going to, going to come up with, with language. It's going to go back and forth with, with landlords and there'll, there'll be some, you know, standard or accommodation that everybody will get to, but it, it is going to be part of um, every lease going forward. And, you know, as Jeffrey said, I mean, you know, when I started in this business, leases were five to 10 pages long, there are a hundred now there'll be 105. I mean, you know, it's just, just the way it is, but it will be part of, of um, every lease and L every LOI going forward. Right. For those, I, I noticed that a lot of people have just joined us in the last couple of minutes. We're here talking New York city retail with three of the top uh, retail leasing deal makers in the city. And uh, this panel is sponsored by RXR volunteers. So uh, Jeffrey, there's a very interesting quote from uh, Michael, Phillips of Jamestown in, in an article in the journal a couple of days ago. And he said, he's like, the days of being an overlord and just collecting rents are over. He's, he's like, this is no longer going to be the landlord tenant relationship that we've had for decades, which is sign a lease, take a space, pay your rent and you're done. So there's a lot more conversations and anyone who's had experience with this, please do jump in because this is a very important structural point for where we might be in the market five years down the line. But uh, there's talk about, you know, more revenue sharing agreements, uh, maybe a landlord taking an equity stake in a retailer. Uh, what, what do you think of that? And if that happens, what does that mean for brokers? All good questions. I mean, look, first off, Michael is one of the most progressive, you know, his, him and his company, one of the most progressive companies out there. They've all, they've always been, and they always do sort of think forward. Um, yeah, I think specifically in the restaurant industry, um, over the past few years, revenue sharing has become a little bit more popular. You know, certainly when you go out of the city and you go to any of the hotels or the resorts, restaurants don't pay rent there. You know, the casinos, those are all revenue sharing deals. Um, we started to see a bit of it pre-COVID. Pre um, I think moving forward, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be... Uh, extremely prevalent in, in you know, a restaurant uh, landlord negotiation. And certainly, again, for the, for the short term. And, and restaurants coming back, um, when they reopen, they're going to be opening at 50% if capacity. So yeah. I think most owners are going to have to, uh, you know, understand that, you know, the, the restaurant's not going to be able to be profitable. So he'll get back up and running and... Um, you know, then then work out a deal where the where the revenue sharing goes to a more traditional type rent. But we're talking. You don't think this is a long term structural thing in, in in terms of the the traditional lease is still going to be the way they do business going forward, David? Yeah, no, I I I agree with 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 Jeffrey. Although the definition of 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 short term is is the key, and I would say. 
you know, I, I would define short term in this case as being years, not months. So, um, how many? Know, years? Yeah, how many years do you think? I, I think I think there's going to be a, a you know a percentage rent piece of this that's a big piece of this for two or three years out. But at the same time, those of us that that rent that represent national retailers that you know those deals are, are typically you know at least 20 years long when you include the term and the option so i agree with jeffrey that at some point it, it'll convert over to a to a more traditional deal but you know the new york has has been getting the last few years you know 60 to 70 million tourists have come into this market it's hard for me to imagine you know what that number is going to be you know for the next year or or even through this holiday season but it's going to be a small fraction of that and that drives a lot of the 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 restaurant business right. particularly in areas like times square and unless you know, unless they so. come up with a vaccine if they come up with a vaccine then it's uh it's sooner than a year and a half that's for sure some doctors are predicting uh, uh by september or october even if there is a vaccine, though, James, don't you think there's a long-term fear that might have set in from this? Because if it had been a week or two weeks, like 9-11 was, you know, three weeks of paralysis and then a slow recovery, right? But there was well, a death. Yeah, but, but don't forget 9-11. People were, were scared. Yeah. You know, I was scared to get on a plane for, for months. You know what I mean? I, I don't think that that's, it, it's, it wasn't, you know, 9-11 was not, we didn't go back to normal right away. We, we adapted to the new reality. And that's what we're gonna be doing here. There's gonna be a new reality. Whereas, you know, we never used to walk through turnstiles to walk into buildings or, or have to take off your shoes before you got on a plane or have to sign into an office building. And we yeah. do it now, we don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna sort of, we're gonna go on with our life uh, a little bit more, uh, you know, germ phobic moving forward. We're just, that's, we're gonna adapt it. We're gonna probably wear masks and gloves in certain situations. Um, and maybe, you know, probably not think about it after a while. And then, you know, it'll, it'll adapt into a new normal. Yeah. People, I, I, People, people have short-term memories. They, they don't remember, you know, uh, in, I think in three months, people start thinking less about this. In six months, even less. Again, if, if they have a vaccine, it's even quicker. But I think we bounce back quick. David, I wanted to ask about, just back to your point about if this is, a, if the short-term is two or three years, uh, since we're all, you know, we're all brokers here, what does that mean in terms of the way that you guys get paid in terms of compensation, in terms of commissions? Um, well, I think, you know, I think that, um, you know, for the, for the brokers that represent retailers, which, which I do, I think, um, I think landlords are going to be happy to see us coming. So I think, I, I don't think getting paid, um, will be an issue. I think, you know, we'll have to work around if there is a percentage rent piece of it. Yeah. Um, we'll have to work around that. I think um, the commission may be more on a fixed fee basis than the way we've traditionally done it, just with percentages of rents. But I think, I think we'll get through that piece. I think if you're showing up with a tenant, you're going to be a popular guy or gal. Yeah, I think, I uh, I think we're going to get paid. In terms of the compensation model, in terms of how you, you guys structure your financial, you know, your, your path ahead, you sort of think about the commission income that you're going to make. You think, if I do X amount of deals, this is what I, you know, hope to take home this year. Uh, a lot of that is going to be in flux, I think. And that's what, that's what I was interested in uh, knowing a little bit about. I think the more important question is how, how do uh, landlords finance the assets mm -hmm. with uh, percentage rent? I mean, they, they have to put something in the performer on what that asset is going to earn. And with a percentage rent, you can't do that. I think that's the bigger question. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say percentage rent is better than no rent. So that, Agreed. Would, be that would be my answer. <laughs> Fair enough. Agreed. I, I was... Uh, 
this this past weekend, I was chatting, and we're, I'm starting to see a lot of questions come in, so I'll, I'll take a few in a sec. But uh, we, I was having a chat with Brendan Wallace, who's the head of Fifth Wall Ventures, one of the larger real estate-focused VC funds, and he said his plan is basically, first of all, he called for a bailout of the retail industry. He said there's not really been any accommodation made for one of the largest. Right. He's right. There hasn't been. Yeah. Industries employing people. He, he estimated about 50 million people are employed directly or indirectly by retail. So I wanted to ask you guys about some sort of, if you think there's any sort of government assistance that's necessary. And he also had a plan to get the five biggest landlords in a room with the government and kind of hash out some standards. Uh, thoughts on that? Because I thought that was a pretty provocative thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it's very important that, that we, we, we figure out some sort of a bailout because it all trickles up. If the tenant is not paying the landlord, the landlord is not paying his people, he's not paying the taxes, he's not paying the mortgage, then the banks feel the effect and, and it goes on and on and on. So we, we need to figure out something and the money that they're allocating is just not enough. Yeah, there's, there's been no help for the commercial landlords. There's been help for all the other sort of industries. But, you know, when retailers are asking to either for forgiveness or, or rent deferrals, you know, as of yet, landlords have been unable to get that. Now, obviously, the bigger ones can, can sort of survive, but the smaller landlords are, are struggling through that. And, and, you know, who's right in that situation? Clearly the retailer is not open, he can't pay, but you know, the bank is not forgiving the, the, the mortgage. So it's- And, it's, and real estate taxes, nobody's forgiven any real estate taxes yet that I know of, so. Right. Yeah, is there any, any sort of momentum gaining on, on working with the government city or, or state government to forgive certain taxes, property taxes at the city level, I guess? I, I think it's going to be hard. The, the, the city and the state, you know, and the, everybody's going to be hard pressed, you know, on, on cash and money that they're not getting sales tax. But, you know, they're, they're, I mean, that's a, you know, that's a storm that's coming too that, that, you know, it's going to be difficult to deal with. And I don't know that, you know, it doesn't seem like the federal government's going to help the states out so much on that. So, that's that's a problem and i don't see how they can um give relief on on real estate taxes that's you know a source of income they need all of you work with uh, large national landlords do you think there's any potential of getting them in a room and and going to the government and saying look these five companies or the representatives of these companies uh are responsible for x million square feet of space do you really want that space to go under do you want you know, New York City, Upper Fifth Avenue to look like downtown Detroit. Um, if not, can we work something out? Is there any conversation you think could happen to that? Yeah, I think that could happen. And I, I, my, my guess is, you know, that this president probably talks to some of the major real estate guys in New York, maybe on a, on a weekly basis. So, you know, he's a real estate guy and he knows he knows the key players in New York. So I would be hopeful that, that maybe that would happen. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're getting in some questions. First question is from Tom Brady. He just says, hi, James. So hi, James. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're also, uh, people were asking about the subscription code that I mentioned. It's just my first name. That's H-I-T-E-N. And we'll have that in the recap here as well. But uh, we, have, we have some questions from... Uh, this is a question from uh, what specific sector do you see changing the most? F and B, personal health services, or office? I guess whoever wants to take that. I uh, I think restaurants uh, will change dramatically, especially when you're on the fifty percent ratio. The restaurant operators I've been talking to are uh, planning to fill every other table to respect the social distancing uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, but they also plan on ramping up delivery to kind of compensate for the loss of, of the in, in restaurant diners. Um, so I think that's going to be effective. I honestly don't feel that uh, a lot of people I've been reading, uh, a lot of people are speculating on offices being canceled and people working from home. I honestly don't see that. I think if we see a 5% decrease, I'd be surprised. 
I, th I think the, the, you know, the major changes that are going to come to what I would call the stars, you know, of the last 10 years since the last recession, which were food, fitness, and entertainment. Those guys, I mean, that's where, you know, a lot of the deals the three of us have done over, you know, the last few years. And those guys are all hurting. They're all going to have to sort of reinvent themselves to some degree. Movie theaters, fitness chains, I mean, they're going to have to figure it out and, and reinvent themselves a little bit. And as James said, the, you know, the, the food industry, especially, especially, you know, the, the fast casual, the quick serve, the takeout guys are really in place. I think they'll, they'll be fine. The, the full service sit down restaurants and the ones that depend on the business community and, and the tourists, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough road back for those guys and they're going to need help from both the government and from landlords. It's quite unfortunate because I'm, I'm sure this happened with, with brokers, you would use the energy of a, a hot restaurant in a space to maybe market the other aspects, the other unclaimed space, right? And that, that's gonna be a little bit harder if there's social distancing rules, you don't have the same buzz, uh, the footprints might be smaller. So do you think uh, on the restaurant front, do you think it's going to be more cloud kitchens, ghost kitchens, some of that stuff? Because the food's still gonna be important. Delivery is going up, but, but maybe physical space may not be as important. I, I don't see that. I, I think, look, quick, quick service, that, you know, which is, that really helps the, 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 where the ghost kitchens come in for the delivery. You know, that's been rising in popularity to begin with. Um, I, I think restaurants are going to figure it out. I think the, the, the more comfortable we're going to, they're going to make us feel is, you know, we may not base it as much on food in the short term as sort of where we feel uh, that they're, they're, you know, put in the most uh, safety in place. And, and so um, there's a lot of creative entrepreneurial people in all the industries that we've spoken about. Um, so what do you mean by that? So you're saying the, the sanitary or the sanitation facility or amenities will become almost a calling card for certain restaurants? Well, I think, I think to, in the short term, again, I, I, I keep looking at a short term, long term um, theory. But in the short term, yeah, I, I think that if, if, a, if a restaurant has sort of done the right things with, I don't worry, you know, they, they take out a lot of the touch and feel and, and um, out of the, out of the, the um, uh, you know, visit, you're, you're going to feel a little bit better. We want to go out. I, I do believe that people want to go to a restaurant and, and you may not go to a restaurant that's four deep at the bar, but if you feel that a, that a, uh, an operator is sort of, it looks right, they're doing the right things, you know, we, we can't stay home, you know, I, I, I truly believe that. David, there's a question probably, this is good for you. To, this is from Dante Tauro saying that if states and cities don't give landlords tax relief, what happens when landlords stop or can't pay taxes? I, I, you know, it's, it's a, it's a catch 22. The, the, you know, the question is where are the states and the cities going to get income from? And, and on top of the sales tax, which I mentioned, you know, a lot of people's incomes are dropping too. So there's going to be less revenue from that. And I'm just hoping they don't go the other way and, and, and raise taxes um, on, on stuff. But, and, and the tenants, you know, wind up paying some, some of those tax pass throughs too. So it would be great if they could figure out a way to give tax relief. I just, I'm not sure I see, you know, the road or the path, how they, how the cities can do that or the states can do that. James, anything on that from you? I mean, where's the money going to come from? I, they have to, uh, there's not enough money in the stimulus. Uh, we're we're going to take all SBAs or, I mean, the money's got to come from somewhere. Right. Okay. So I, I want to move on to the sort of the business of brokerage. And uh, we've already seen in the last I want to say 24 months, 36 months, a lot of consolidation in the retail brokerage space and in commercial brokerage in general. Uh, with, with much of this turmoil that has happened and expected, do you see more consolidation happening? Uh, Jeffrey, you're probably at the biggest firm in terms of, of headcount. Maybe we'll start with you. 
Look, I, I think that after um, situations like this, there, there, there is a bit of a shakeout in, in industry. Um, I think our role, and we sort of touched on it earlier, our role is going to get more important. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're going to be looked at more as advisors to both the retail side and the landlord side. It's not a traditional sort of deal anymore where you're just sort of hawking space. I think there's a lot that has to go into every, every move is, it has to be a calculated move on both sides. And so, um, I think it'll weed out some sort of, some folks that may, uh, you know, not be right for this path. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I, I do see our role as, as, as I- increasing, and I don't know what that does to the industry. Perhaps there's a shrinking of, of other firms as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, there'll be, there'll be changes for sure. But do you think that that means uh, in terms of specialization, you know how a lot of brokers are mostly deal with landlords, mostly deal with tenants. Do you think there'll be more of a hybrid model of broker going forward? I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's going to get that. Um, you know, drastic, but, uh, you know, I, I just see less, less in the, in the industry. David. Yeah, no, I was going to say Jeffrey brings up a great point because th- there's going to be more of a need for good brokers. The, this, this is not business as usual. You know, we've talked about the percentage rent piece, but for sure deals are going to have to be, you know, more creative. Uh, we're all going to have to put on our thinking caps and whether that's, um, percentage rent, whether that's landlords getting um, more involved as, as investors to keep some of their tenants going. I mean, there's, there's, there's definitely, you know, we're going to have to come up with, with some new and creative ideas. And, I, and, and, and landlords are smart enough. They don't want to lose existing tenants. So, you know, there's, there's obviously getting new tenants, but it's, it's also – you know, doing what you need to do to keep existing tenants and, and liquidity is going to be an issue for tenants, particularly um, restaurant tenants. It's it's almost, you know, they're not just coming in and turning on the lights when, you know, when this has happened, they really have to, you know, it's, it's bringing back people, it's bringing back inventory and, and, and there's going to be cost to them. And when they open their, their, the revenue is going to be down. It just is. They're not going to be doing the, the business they did. So they're, they're going to need help. A lot of the questions that are coming in are expressing anxiety about the restaurant industry. There's questions like, George asked, can we get permits for sidewalk table service? People have asked about relaxing restrictions on alcohol. Uh, so there seems to be a lot of pain on that front. James, any optimism on, on the city policy level in terms of dealing with the outdoor dining experience, eating out, and what that means for the real estate? Well, we're already seeing some restrictions being relaxed. Uh, the SLA approved alcohol delivery from restaurants. So if you want a mixed drink or something, you can order it from your favorite restaurant and they'll, they'll deliver just a cocktail or a, a beer or a mixed drink. You, you weren't allowed to do that pre-pandemic. Um, and the outdoor cafes, I don't see any reason why the city won't issue licenses as long as the six foot, um, the six foot uh, social distancing is respected. And it might be easier, right? It might be easier if you open up the outdoors a little bit, it might be easier to actually adhere to social distancing. Uh, so all of you are still young and handsome men, but you've mentored a lot of people in your time and we're getting some questions here about if, you know, if it's a young broker starting out, and at a time where David and Jeffrey both mentioned experience is going to count a lot more than maybe even in the past. If you were a young retail broker starting out, uh, what do you do and, and where do you go from here? Uh, whoever wants to take that. I, I think this event either could make you or break you. Uh, mm-hmm. Like Jeff said earlier, the, uh, the, the people that are just starting out in the last few months or a few years may feel overwhelmed and they shouldn't. They should, st- they should uh, stand their ground and keep moving forward. Uh, I think one thing that we can all agree upon is there's going to be a ton of retail spaces on the market. They just need uh, us more than ever 
to show it, to, to structure creative deals, and to work with tenants. If it, it might be percentage rent, it may be a low base rent and, and somewhat of a profit share. One way or the other, we have to rent everything. I've been talking to landlords and some landlords say, you know, their response to the market is they'll rent the spaces for a year or two years or five years. So they don't have to commit on a long-term basis at a really low rent, but at least they'll, they'll get the space monetized. That's the most important thing. Anyone else want to go on that? Young broker coming in, what do they do? I, I think, I mean, there will be, there will be new, I mean, Jeffrey can jump in on this too, but we, you know, we he and I have talked about tenants that, that showed up, you know, either, either after the recession or after 9-11. And it is, an, you know, New York's an expensive market. And, you know, the brave ones, this is an opportunity to, to get in when you couldn't afford to get in before. So, you know, young brokers have to, you know, hopefully reach out and find some tenants that aren't here now, or there may be some, some new concepts that didn't exist before this, that this creates, you know, it, it just will. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the, uh, the, the fire after, you know, the forest fire, there's, there'll be some new sprouts coming up in, in the woods that, you know, we haven't thought of. And if you can think of those or get to some of those, those concepts and, and, you know, Tell them how great, because New York is, you know, it really is the center of the, not only the business world, but, but the entertainment, right. sports, med society, and, 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 and retail of really of none of the U.S. or the world, and it, and it still will be. So you know, that, that's, that's what we all have to tell clients. Great point. The, the, the reality is, as difficult as it will be for young people breaking into the industry, it's going to be difficult for young people breaking into any industry coming on the heels of this. You know, whether you're going into the movie business or the sports business or, you know, nothing has been not touched by this. So um, no industry. I, 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 you know, I mean, obviously a few, but so, so we are, this is, this is historic times. It's, it's not related just to the retail brokerage business. It really is uh, global and, and, uh, touching all, all. Right, uh, right before the call, just, just, just for our, I had asked our, our panelists to be as brutally honest as they could about the landscape, and you could still hear the optimism, which I think is great. So let me play Pollyanna then and, and read you another uh, observation that Zell had made. He said, look, retail always had the best corners, right? The prime spots in Fifth Avenue, near some Madison Avenue, et cetera, where people are, where people want to be. Well, the best corners are defined as where the traffic is. But if the overall level of traffic diminishes, then the definition of best corners also kind of changes. So let, let me put this scenario to you. This, this goes on, you know, for another few months. And there's, there's uh, defaults on loans, properties turn over, and maybe the next, the best use of that property isn't retail anymore. Maybe it's multifamily. Um, have, have, you, have you considered that scenario at all? I haven't quite considered multifamily. I, I have thought perhaps, you know, some office uses could, could uh, you know, go down and take some ground floor space at some point. Um, I, I just, uh, you know, yeah, I, I don't see it getting that dire. Um, but again, I think we are optimists by nature, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this for a living. And, and it's, it's hard to, for me to wrap my arms around you know, the world coming to a, a total end, because that's really what you're talking about. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with, with Jeff. I could see, I mean, you know, medical uses coming to the street or, or becoming, you know, the retail street is something that's been going on for a while. I think as, the, as potentially as the, if the rents drop, I think you'll see, you know, more of that. And as the spread maybe between office and retail, um, is, is not as great. I think that's a, a trend that will continue for for lots of reasons. So I think something like that. But otherwise, no. I think retail will will be back, and and you know, it's it's a blip. It's just a question and a pause, and we can all guess and debate. But, but we're all just guessing on how long it'll be. But it it, it will come back. Your take is upper fifth stays upper fifth. 
Soho is Soho, that the, the essential makeup will stay about the same. So Scott Rogers asks, uh, and this is, this, is a, this is a great question from Scott. He says, are panelists seeing or hearing of any big retailers wanting to take advantage of this depressed market by locking in some good long-term deals uh, for, for great space, maybe at a, at a significant discount? Are you seeing anything from your clients or out there that, that is like, look, I, I wanna be in New York. I, I believe in the city. Let, let's, let's make it happen now. Not from the big retailers, not from the, the national companies, I but from local, from local people. You know, I, I think there's, there's a, a bit of optimism and, and they feel, you know what, uh, when you toss a lemon, how do you make lemonade? So, so I've been talking to quite a few people and they say they, they want to rent, they want to take advantage, advantage of this uh, event and rent quite a few stores. I, there are some big retailers in the marketplace right now looking at deals, doing deals. I, I, I uh, you know, I mean, I've heard, and I'm not giving away any secrets, Target has been kicking tires, Amazon has been kicking tires, Whole Foods has been kicking tires. Um, you know, and that's just a few. And I, nor do, I don't think that they're looking to sort of, um, you know, uh, take take total advantage of the market i th i think obviously they're going to use it um you know the the sort of nature of the market but i don't think that's why they're doing it right now because they believe rents are 50 percent um the drugstores are still doing deals supermarkets are still doing deals we'll get to that the drugstores because we'll, we'll definitely talk about that go ahead yeah so so uh, you know there is activity uh, you brought up michael phillips earlier there was a deal I heard at, uh, at uh, Industry City where uh, one of the car dealerships just leased a, a big chunk of space for a showroom. Um, you know, those are, those are all great signs. David's great tenant signed a deal not that long ago at the Empire State Building, which to me is a, is a fabulous deal for the, for the sort of spirit of, of retail. You know, I mean, they're, they're putting their money where their mouth is and, and, uh, you know, that's, that's encouraging. Those are the encouraging signs. Yeah, so, we're, I mean, we're seeing from our well-capitalized tenants, whether it's Whole Foods or Sweetgreen or Starbucks, they're still looking at, at deals. They may tweak or, or, or do something a little different than they've done before. In the case of, of Starbucks, they had started up, you know, prior to the virus with um, opening a couple of the uh, mobile app stores. I think that's something, you know, that – um, will potentially be out doing a bunch of going going forward um, smaller stores that are you know mostly just just pick up and I think you know there there will be deals and I think everybody's gonna I think everybody wants to see you know where the market um, resets and I think that will you know I think that will happen in the next few months you know mm -hmm. And and there'll be pushback, and like there always is, landlords will be uh, reluctant to do that. But you know, real world stuff, they want to make a deal. Uh, at least over the next few months, they're they're going to have to. There's going to have to be some major adjustment on rents. Jeff, you mentioned uh, drugstores, and uh, that brings me to one of your tweets. So if, if people don't know, Jeff is one of the most avid. Uh, tweeters on, on the retail real estate landscape. And Jeff had tweeted something really interesting about now it's the time to get rid of what he called archaic retail zoning in New York City. Uh, because people have, you know, historically if a CVS or a Dwayne Reed or a quote unquote boring tenant moves into a neighborhood, you do hear a lot of pushback. It is quite difficult in some cases. So what were your thoughts and uh, why did you, you know, talk about that and what, what's your solution? Well, I was watching, there was, an, it was a segment on one of the news channels and they were sort of going up Broadway and they were showing, you know, how most of the shops were closed and Trader Joe's was open and, and CVS was open and Whole Foods was open. And, and it was sort of, you know, everyone was going into these stores to get what they needed, you know, all their essentials for, you know, with the, with the thought of sort of quarantining for God knows how long. And, and, you know, it, it sort of brought me to the point where, you know, look, national chains obviously serve a need They uh -huh. in the city. They also, you know, do bring some other baggage with them. Um, but for the most part, I, I don't think it's, it's 
um, right for us to try to keep them out of neighborhoods. Uh, you know, there, there have been, the city has in, in, uh, put some zoning laws, you know, Upper West Side, for instance, you know, there's new laws where you cannot put, you know, banks and drugstores and supermarkets and, and, you know, I'm not sure the reasoning for that, you know, I mean, Fairway was an independent store, obviously right. before, and they did fine. You know what I mean? They could hold their own against all the other supermarkets for many, many years. So, so what's your solution? Are you saying economics should be the only uh, determining factor of, of that? or, or you Why both? economics? It's just yeah. why prohibit them from coming in? Yeah, yeah it's, you know, it's, it's, let the people vote. The people yeah. will vote. If, they, if there are too many drugstores, they'll They're stop shopping. Stop right. it, let, let the market decide. That's, I mean, I think we probably, the three of us would, would all agree on that. Don't overregulate, you know, business. I mean, you know, there was a time when people thought there were too many video stores in, in the city. You know, I mean, it, 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 it'll yeah, work itself out. The funny thing is Barnes and Noble was the killer when they came into the, yeah. you know, when they took over, they were the ugly giant who came in to destroy all the bookstores. Then when Barnes and Noble started going out of business, people were crying in front of the Barnes and Noble stores. We're <laughs> going to lose Barnes and Noble. How the city is terrible. You know, look, people will, will fight and, and sort of have opinions whichever way it goes. And so there's sort of no win, but, um, I think they all coexist, and, and uh, to David's point, let the people will decide. If they don't want to shop there, they're not going to. I want to ask one sort of technical question and then get into e-commerce because it's coming up quite a bit in our, in our Q&A. But uh, someone asked, one of our reporters asked, uh, you know, owners this summer will have to file income reports for retail spaces as part of New York City's new retail storefront tracker. And the city created that requirement to address the issue of, you know, growing vacancies. And that's, that's where that came from. Is the 2019 income and expense information relevant in this age, given what we're dealing with? I personally think that's pre-pandemic. I think that's probably going to be re-looked at and maybe either will be canceled. Worse. What? 2020 will be worse, the income. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I, I think they relax that and, and focus on survival uh, and, and continue to kind of ramp up uh, after we reopen. Yeah, I mean, and that's the other, uh, that's another, it goes to the previous question. Landlords don't want to keep spaces right. vacant. They just don't. And, and you know, for, for the city officials to think a guy wants to keep a space vacant, he hasn't gotten the right tenant. Yes, he, he hasn't gotten the rent that he either wants or needs to get because the bank is putting restrictions on him. You know, it's not that they choose to kick out mom and pop retailers. No one wants an empty store. But yeah. if a tenant can't pay the rent or if, a, you know, not every mom and pop is sort of doing the right thing and paying the rent and doing business. It's, yeah. it's, it's, not a, it's not a black or white issue. It seems like it was an easy shot for politicians to take maybe, right? Because that's it's a very, easy shot. Shot, very strong symbol of whatever they want to talk about. Uh, so let's talk about e-commerce now. We've seen in the past, I want to say eight weeks, the largest forced adoption of e-commerce, right? There was already, e-commerce was already taking up more and more market share, but people are, many people are shopping online for the first time, even more people are just broadening the categories of what they would buy. So I, I bought sweatpants on Amazon for the first time, right? I would typically, that's, a, that's an in-person experience that I'd normally have. Uh, so if, if e-commerce has dramatically upped its game and, or its volume, what, you know, given the ease of it, given the convenience, given the lack of touch points, if, you know, you're putting yourself less at risk, is there, why would that regress? Do you think that trend will continue? I mean, I, I personally think after being quarantined for as long as we all have, we can't wait to go to the store and shop and, and browse. You can't replace that feeling of interacting with people, even if it's with gloves on um, and, and browsing the mm -hmm. colors and, the, and feeling the fabric. So I don't think that's going to replace, be replaced. I think if you need a T-shirt or socks, you may still order it through Amazon, mm -hmm. but the in-store experience will never go away. That's e my opinion. E-commerce was only what? It was less than 10% of 
of yes. retail sales before this. Yes. So if it's if it's gone up to fifteen percent moving forward, um, you know that's still eighty five percent brick and mortar. And and what it will do is it will weed out again the retailers that have not sort of progressed and figured out a, a great uh, both online and brick and mortar uh, a strategy. And, and uh, but, but I don't, it's not to James's point, it's not going to replace certain things, sweatpants, a, a pair that you know that you like, and you know, the size you're going to yeah. order those, but you're not going to order other things. And, and again, to James's point, people want to go out. They more so than ever, the experience is uh, what we need. Right. So, David, uh, you work with a lot of national tenants who are, are planning their footprints, maybe, hey, look, in, in the next year, we want to roll out 20 stores in these markets. Uh, maybe, is that number maybe now going to be down? Hey, we're going to do 12 stores and take some of that money and invest more in our online experience. Any, any conversations like that so far? Um, I, I, think, I think, yes. I think there's some of that. I think there's, I think everybody's taken this pause to, to, to evaluate their, their portfolios and their strategies. They probably have more time um, to do that th than they have before. And I, but I also think, you know, the, the people um, will, will look at, at, at their existing stores as, and say, you know, do I renovate them now or do I change them in some way to make them more compatible with, with, with what's going on in, mm -hmm. in the world, so I, I think there, I think a lot, a lot of it is revisiting um, your existing portfolio and taking a look at that in a in a different way um, versus just char charging forward. Um, but yeah, there will be um, overall there will be um, probably less expansion and less less deals until you know until there is. Um, a vaccine or a cure, you know, I think, I think there will be caution. And I think, I think New York does have, at least in, in the short term, has additional issues and problems that, that potentially other areas of the, of the country, mm -hmm. you know, still have, but they don't have as much as, as what, we what do. do mean, what do you mean by that? Well, in other words, restaurants. So a lot of uh, the, the restaurant portfolios, you know, drive-ins are a huge part you know, of, of yeah. around the country, yeah. um, in it, for, for a lot of restaurants or quick serve, it's, it's the majority, obviously in, in, in Manhattan, we don't have that. And, 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 and the drive throughs have, have, um, in many cases maintained their volume dur during this or got, or, or stayed close. So, um, you know, so the comeback, I think in New York will be, it's going to be a slower process back than it may be in some other areas. For the deals that are happening, uh, James, maybe you could take this one. This is a question from Staten Brown. Uh, for the deals that are happening or conversations that are happening, how do we set rents again when comps are no longer valid? Do you, is it just a supply and demand game or is there more to it at this point? I'm talking about the, the situation we're in now. So right now it's a fluid situation because we're still learning. You know, if you asked me that question six weeks ago, I said, I would say, you know, uh, nobody is renting. But in the last few weeks, we have closed deals. So we're, we're using the same guidelines as we did before this happened. Are we signing deals at the same level that we did before this happened? Absolutely not. But if a tenant is willing to pay 10% below market or 15%, as long as the landlord is uh, in agreement, we're going to sign, you know. But other than, than a slight reduction in price and maybe uh, not only a pandemic clause to protect the tenant going forward, you have uh, an, an additional clause that say, you know what, I'm going to sign a lease today, but our free time starts when the quarantine is lifted. Mm -hmm. There's a question in which I think is a great question about uh, the subways and public transit and how the impact of public transit on retail real estate. So, you know, I'm just remembering going in to Prince Street in the N or the R, getting out of that massive humanity and suddenly I'm shopping, right? And I think one of the draws of going there was just easy access to public transit 
and then you're in the mix and you don't have to worry about anything. Uh, there is concern that ridership, at least with people who could afford other options, I'm not talking about the vast majority of New Yorkers who don't have other options, but people who can afford other options may not take public transit as much, which means that uh, retail around mass transit may not see uh, the benefits of being there. Uh, Jeff, you want to take that? Yeah, look, I, I mean, and, and to David's point before, it's sort of, you know, people who, that, that's a New York City centric problem. If you work, if you live in, uh, you know, Atlanta, you're driving to work, you're parking, you're walking to your desk, you're not going up an elevator. Um, so the retailers, you know, won't suffer that, that fate. In the city, again, this is a short, you know, I, I hate to keep going back to it, but for the short term, yes, the, the subway system and, and the, the stores around subway will probably be uh, affected. Um, you know, there tend to be a huge concentration of people anyway by the subway stops because it's usually a prime corner that people either, you know, congregate at or are sort of crossing the street. So, you know, hopefully it doesn't doesn't get too impacted. But subway ridership for sure is is going to be a concern. And, and that's is true of, of, of also all public transportation. So it, it hits Grand Central, it hits Penn Station, it hits Port Authority. I mean, there's great, you know, retail around all of those. And, and just the same, you know, same thing as the, as the subways. So in the short term, they're all, you know, ridership's going to be down at, on all those mass transit. But there's still a lot of people in the city, you know, <laughs> that, that, that really the traffic, even on a bad day, is better than than many blocks anywhere else in the country. So, um, you know, that's consideration. Right. We're just about going to wrap up. I, I do want to thank again our sponsor, RxR Realty, and their initiative, RxR Volunteers. Uh, again, if you want to subscribe this week, we have a 10% discount. Just use my first name. That's Hiten, H-I-T-E-N. And I, I want to wrap up by asking our panelists, this is a, a thought exercise, but... At the city, state, and federal levels, if there was one thing, if you had, you know, 10 minutes with President Trump, 10 minutes with Mayor de Blasio, 10 minutes with Governor Cuomo, what would you say? I'm going to give James the city, since I know he's a fan. Uh, I'm going to give David the state, and I'm going to give Jeffrey the federal decision. So, James, if you had 10 minutes with uh, Mayor de Blasio. And First, it's about I'd, real estate, not, not about, or your business. Don't, don't go into too many. Could areas. I ask him to leave office? No, you can't. Uh, okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, what I would I would ask him is to to work with small businesses. They're the the fabric of our city, and any way he he could possibly defer taxes and and help with additional SBA loans or or any way possible to to work with small businesses to keep them because as david mentioned and i think jeff uh, also mentioned it a lot of these small businesses are undercapitalized so they don't they can't just reopen in in two or four weeks from now they have to thoroughly clean the restaurants and their shops they have to restock everything they have to pay employees to reopen they have to do new advertising campaigns so uh, please help them, Mr. Mayor, and, you know, keep our city strong. David, uh, you've just reached uh, the court, Albany, and you've got 10 minutes with uh, Governor Cuomo. Go ahead. Well, I'm a fan of Cuomo, so I'm happy to spend 10 minutes with him. But I, I, I would go along and say there needs to be funding specific to, to retailers and, and small retailers. And as far as lifting you know, the spirit of, of the city, you know, when you walk down the street, you could walk by a, a, an office building that's a million square feet, but what you see and what you notice is the stores on the ground floor. So if those stores are vacant and there's substantial vacancy and the restaurants aren't active, you know, I, I think it impacts, you know, the whole spirit of the city. And I think, you know, if we're gonna lift ourselves up, like retail's a really good place to 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 start, and and I would say like a state assistance program for retail. Yeah, yeah, for for retail, and I get, and I know, you know, the funds are going to be an issue, but helping you know, 
you know, retailers and, and especially smaller retailers stay on their feet and stay open, I think is, is very important to the city. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, you're in the Oval. Go. <laughs> Um, I, I think that it would be important for uh, the Fed to to treat commercial landlords, and, and again, the, especially the commercial landlords that, that need help, um, because for the same reason that we're all saying, we're sort of coming around full circle here, the commercial landlords still have to pay their mortgages. And, and so they, you know, the retailers need a break, and the commercial landlords, I think, for the most part, want to give them a break. But if, they, if they're not getting any sort of incentive from, you know, the Fed, any sort of stimulus package, and again, it doesn't have to be, we're not talking about the, the elite landlords around town. We're talking about, for most part, there's many mom and pop landlords as there are, you know, mom and pop retailers. So I think it's, it's really important. Nothing has been done in, with that regard and, and no forgiveness, no, you know, there, there's got to be some sort of plan that so that the retailers and the landlords can work together and the landlords don't worry about sort of defaulting. I think we'll leave it there. Jeffrey, David, and James, thank you very much for your time and insights. This has been another edition of The Real Deals Talks, TRD Talks Live. Thank you again to our sponsor, RxR Realty, and uh, thank you everyone. So we'll see you soon. Thanks for putting it together. Thanks for having us. Our pleasure. Great, guys.